Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman. We're broadcasting on Facebook Live and we are also recording for a publication for a later date. Our message today for the 27th of January is coming from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. So before we get into looking at God's word, let's stop, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. Father God, we thank you for every one looking in today. We do ask that you would use the time to give glory and honor to you and that everything said and done is led by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the freedom we still enjoy to be able to preach and teach your word here. And we pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. So follow with me, please, as we read from Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his banner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and one of the and, one, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered of a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought, in, sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren into the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason also hath received, and these also do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let him go. Well, here we are as Paul, Paul and Silas and Luke continue their journeys, and they are in Europe. They're in Macedonia. This is where Thessalonica is. Thessalonica is still, is still a city. It's occupied by about a half a million people in uh, North Macedonia, which is northern Greece. It is refer, referred to today as Thessaloniki or Salonica, and um, it's been continuously inhabited since the time that the Apostle Paul and his friends were here. Now, they were going about through the Gentile world, but note the first thing that happens. When they came to the cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So they were making their way, and they obviously didn't stop or do anything. In the other two places, we would have had reading about it. And they came and they went to, as was the manner of Paul, they found a synagogue of the Jews. Now, that may seem a little bit redundant to refer to a synagogue of the Jews, but uh, the word synagogue comes from a Greek word, synagogue, and this word means meeting place. So it could be a meeting place of Gentiles. It could be a meeting place of worshipers of the uh, goddess Diana, but this is a synagogue of the Jews. So it's a meeting place of the Jews. And as Paul was, his manner, he went into them and stayed, and it says, three Sabbath days. So three Sabbath days doesn't mean one, two, three. It means three consecutive weeks. A Sabbath day being, as we know in our calendar, Friday at, from uh, sunset to an hour past sunset on Saturday. That would be your first Sabbath day. And then the next one, a week later, and then the next one a week after that. And so there was some sort of establishment of believers. So as we read on here, we'll see this. Paul, as Paul's manner was, and that word there, manner, means his custom. So it was his custom, even though a few chapters earlier, when he had uh, been tossed out of uh, the other places he had been, and the Jewish people got into an uproar over his preaching of Jesus as Messiah, and nothing's going to change here. He, even though he had said, I now go to the Gentiles, Paul still goes to his own people. This is why he wrote very clearly in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jewish people first, never to the exception of anyone else. I'm paraphrasing that because I repeatedly make the comment that to uh, 
the gospel is for all people. And from the book of Genesis right through uh, all of the Hebrew scriptures, it's quite clear that God is going to redeem a people out of the Gentiles. So, he is with them for three Sabbaths, and he reasons with them, not from his own intellect, not from any of his own, you might say, doctrinal training under Gamaliel. He reasons with them out of the scriptures. Now, this is a teaching point here, and this is the one that I'm going to make, is that the number one way to share the gospel with people is out of the scriptures. You've got to use this book. And you've got to know this book in order to be able to reason with people out of the scriptures. And as he did this, he, it says here in verse 3, opening and alleging. Now the word opening doesn't mean he's opening the book. The word literally means explaining. So he would go into the various messianic portions of what would have been the scriptures at that time, the Hebrew scriptures, and he would allege to them. Now that word alleging is not meaning that, well, there is an alleged idea that somebody did something. It's a legal term in, in our more modern English, but the word alleged out of the King James here would mean demonstrating. So he's explaining and demonstrating from the scriptures, and as we go on in this uh, chapter here, that Messiah must have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I, and then he takes it into the personal, whom I preach unto you is the Messiah, is Christ. So he showed them from the scriptures, he opened up the scriptures, he displayed to the scriptures, he demonstrated from the scriptures who Jesus was, and his prophetic pointing forward from the Hebrew scriptures and how it was all fulfilled in him. How does anyone do that? You need to know the word of God. Again, let me stress this point to you, to be students of the word of God. We're still early enough in the new year where we can say to people, resolve, if you do any resolutions, I'm not a resolution maker, resolve that you will be a student in the Word of God, perhaps uh, to a better uh, level in this year. And then he goes on in verse 4, explaining to us Luke, and he says, and some of them believed. Well, some of them were persuaded, is what that means. They were persuaded to believe that it was this Jesus who is the promised Messiah. Some of them believed, and it says here, consorted. It means that they joined with. Now, sometimes the word consort uh, in our more modern vernacular can have a, a negative term. You're consorting with those, uh, those bad guys over there. But it just means that you've joined yourself too. So there are some who believe and they join with Paul, Silas, and Luke. And they become the, the foundation of what would be the church in Thessalonica. So they consort, they join with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks. Now here it is. Some of them, the them here in this case, would be the Jewish people whom were in the synagogue. Some of them believed. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the uh, Roman world at this time is that there were many Greek people, and that means Roman people, non-Jewish people, who were looking for answers in different places. And they would go to find out through the Hebrew scriptures, and they would find this in, in the faraway places from Jerusalem. They'd find this in the local synagogue where the Jewish people would meet. And so it was not uncommon for, as it says here, the Greeks, meaning the Gentile people, they were looking for God to be worshiping and to be with them. And so many of there were many who believed, followed after, Paul and Silas, out of the Jewish group in the synagogue, and many of them who were devout Greeks. In other words, they saw something about the monotheistic God of the Hebrew peoples, and they were devout in that way. And there was a great multitude of them, and of the chief women, not a few. And when you put the whole verse together, what we have here is a good number of Jewish people, a good number of Gentile people, 
and even uh, re highly recognizable women of the city. And it doesn't say whether they were only Jewish, only Gentile, or maybe they were a mix. It doesn't matter. They were not a few who followed after the Apostle Paul and Silas and the teaching that they gave him, they gave them about who Jesus is. Now, a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, I had a phone call from a pastor in the Montreal area looking for some guidance and some help. Some people in his church were uh, now attending on Friday and Saturday at a Messianic synagogue. And then they were coming to church on Sunday to church. Now, the pastor that I spoke with was very clear to me. He says, I don't believe they should be separating themselves out like this. Now, he told me who was involved and, and who is leading um, in this Messianic assembly. And I, I know some of the people from there. My ministry now in Montreal has been ongoing since 1988, as well as here in Ottawa and in Toronto and other places here in North America. And so I'm aware of who is involved in, in um, these assemblies and in other places. And I asked the pastor, I said, what is your understanding of these things? Um, have you ever had an experience with this before? And his answer was, no, I haven't. But now I have, and I need to know more. And I said, good, I'll send you some information for you to look at. And we do have that information. And if you would like that information yourself, I'll give you an address at the end of this um, uh, message today where you can send for that information. We have a brochure on the subject. But one thing that this pastor said to me is that he knew it wasn't right. Jewish people separating themselves from Gentiles, forming a messianic assembly, Worshipping on the Sabbath, Friday and Saturday. Keeping the, um, the Jewish law uh, to a degree, if not to as much as possible. Um, holding on to the old feasts of, these, of the scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, having uh, a fasting on Yom Kippur. Uh, all of these things that uh, I recall very well from my my growing up and in instruction in, in Judaism. But, you see, why is anyone fasting on Yom Kippur when Jesus has been your Yom Kippur? Why is our people looking to keep any part of the law when the scriptures are very clear is that if you break one part of the law, you're guilty of all of the law? There's nobody who has been able to keep all of the law except Jesus. Now, if we take a look here in Acts chapter 17, the first four verses, we see very clearly that, yes, they're worshiping on the Sabbath. And this would have been, at that time in history, would have been the Friday, Saturday. But I'm going to draw you back again to the over one of the overall themes of the book of Acts. And this is that the book of Acts is a book of transition. And the transition that we're seeing is that the Jewish believers are now experiencing the fact that we have come out of the old house of Moses. Remember the teachings in Hebrews that I did for over a year here. We've come out of the old house of Moses. We've now come into the new house of Jesus. And this new house is a house that is headed by uh, Jesus, fulfilling everything that was spoken of by Moses. Look what these verses say here. It says this, that in his manner was he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So Paul was able to show them out of the scriptures that Jesus had fulfilled everything required of the Messiah. And because he had done that, he now was able to say, we have together, we worship together. There is no more... Uh, a fence around that keeps uh, the Gentiles from coming closer, which is how he will write to the Ephesian believers. The fence which was called the Soreg. The Soreg was the fence that kept Gentiles from going any further closer to the temple in the temple area in Jerusalem. The, tor the court of the Gentiles surrounded the outside. Well, the next court after that was the court of Israel, where both Jewish men and women and children could gather. And then the next court af after that, with a fence and an entryway in, was the court of the men, where the men would leave their wives 
and children behind, and they would go into the priest and hand over to the priest their offering for it to be taken in to the temple area to be offered on their behalf because he, they would hand it over another fence which was the court of the priests and nobody could go further than that except the priests and then after the court of the priests was the holy place and then after the holy place was the holy of holies and in the holy place only certain of the levitical priesthood ministered inside keeping the showbread keeping the ner tamid the eternal light going all the time and then there was the holy of holies where the high priest went in once a year but the gentiles could not even get close to that you see jesus became the high priest who went through all of those courts and has taken with him everybody with him as isaiah chapter 42 verse 6 and isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 state he has brought with him all not just Israel, but also of all of the nations. There is no longer any middle wall of partition that separates Jewish and Gentile people. So why are still some Jewish people insisting on worshiping Friday and Saturday? And maybe we'll go to a Gentile church on Sunday. I've heard it put, by the way, by some Messianic people who are very, very, you might say, over the top in some other ways, that Sunday church is for the Gentiles, but Friday, Saturday, Messianic synagogue is for us, the Jewish people. And if you Gentiles want to join us, well, you can if you want. I've also heard it put this way, that those who separate Jewish people out from the church are keeping the church, the predominantly Gentile church, because there are more Gentile people in the world than there are Jewish people, from having the privilege and pleasure of knowing Jewish believers in Jesus who bring with them their background in culture and join together with all of the other nation people who bring their background in culture, but we all become one people together. We don't lose who we, be, who we were when we came. We still retain our identity, but we become one people. God's called out church, the Iglesia, which means God's called out people. It doesn't mean church, doesn't mean denomination, doesn't mean building, doesn't mean anything like that. It's God's people gathered together, the Iglesia. Why are we separating ourselves out? Let's go on here. But the Jews who did not believe were moved with envy. In other words, the ones who were not persuaded. They were moved with envy and took to them certain, it says here, lewd fellows of the baser sort. Well, these are, simply put, one way to, uh, uh, to uh, understand this is that, that long uh, sh uh, phrase there, lewd uh, fellows of the baser sort, means evil men of the marketplace. Now, the marketplace could be holders of all kinds of people, of all kinds of ways. And because they were, they are um, people who are going to um, turn the city its, in its own way and assault the house of Jason and bring them out to the people. Now, Jason was where, Jason's house was where Paul and Silas and Luke were staying. They, they stayed with Jason. He was perhaps one of the leaders in the synagogue. And... They went to look for Paul and Silas, just like they had done this back in Acts chapter 16. We dealt with that for a while. And they wanted to bring them out before the, the magistrates of the city. But they didn't find them. So it says here they drew Jake, Jason out. Well, that word drew there, it literally can be understood from the original language as they dragged him out. So he went, with, uh, he went not wanting to go. And they dragged him out. And they took them to certain uh, people, rulers of the city, and crying this. And I love this line. I had a, a prof in Bible school who taught on this a number of times. He used to have a, a tape of one of his conference messages. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Old English, come hither, means they've come here as well. These that have turned the world upside down. Now that's something to think about for a moment. They've turned the world upside down. Well, what they turned the world upside down is that here is this 
man claiming to have been God who allowed himself to be executed and was seen alive three days later after he had been pronounced dead and taken down from a Roman cross. And people had seen him alive for 40 days after that. And that would turn anybody's world upside down, I want to tell you. And it turned the world upside down because people were being taken out of, as we use that more modern vernacular, being taken out of their comfort zone. Well, good. God needs to do that with us sometimes, just drag us out from where we're just comfortably staying and take us out and have us to consider some things that are a whole lot different. These have turned the world upside down. It was their world, which they were happy to have stay as it was, not to have some people come in with some different teaching here. Well, in verse 7, it goes on here, when Jason had received, and these all do, whom Jason has received. In other words here, it says here, whom Jason has welcomed into their house. So these ones who have come and turned the whole world upside down, Jason has welcomed them in. So there's a plot being spun here, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Contrary to, I, I left out the, the first part of that phrase, contrary to all the decrees of Caesar. Now remember last time when I taught in this chapter that one of the things that repeats itself over and over is that Christianity was not yet what was referred to from the Latin words religio officio, an official religion of the Roman Empire. It was not yet an official religion. The Jewish Sanhedrin back in Jerusalem had petitioned this and they made certain that those who were followers of Jesus, they were going to go after and they got people like Paul, who was then known as Saul back in Acts chapter 8, to go up to Damascus with letters of intent to be, bring back any Jewish people whom they found up there who were worshippers of this Messiah, whom they did not want to accept. Remember I told the story of how Pompey came to Jerusalem, 62 BC, not a drop of blood was spilled, the Jewish religious leadership welcomed him in, and they made a deal. We'll let you have rule over us here, that's fine, but we just want to be able to worship our God in our temple. And Pompey wanted to see that temple, and you know the story I shared with you last time. So, Pompey took that message back to Rome, and Caesar allowed the Judaism of the first century, the last century BC, the first century AD and afterwards, to be an accepted religion within the Roman Empire. If it was not, if your religion, if uh, it was worshipping Diana, if it was worshipping other gods, it had to be accepted because he could not, that religion could not supersede Caesar. Now, you go back and look at some of the things that Pilate questioned Jesus of and you'll see what, why that's important. There is another king, one Jesus, he was fully man and fully God. And that can be discussed in the book of Philippians, where we dealt with that in our teaching here. And you can look at that on our Philippians uh, teaching, which is available here on our YouTube channel. It's going on simultaneous with um, our teaching here in the book of Acts. Jesus emptied himself of all of his godly prerogatives. The kenosis passage of Philippians chapter 2, and willingly, as God, went to die in your place. Now as it goes on here in verse 8, and they troubled the people. The people here would be the crowd. A crowd had assembled. They probably, it's not fully made out to be described to us here, but like in the previous chapter, they brought them to the, the marketplace. And at the marketplace would be the bema seat, the judgment seat, where the magistrates would sit. And if there was a dispute of something, it would be brought before the public, who would, you might say, be its own kind of jury in its own way. So they troubled the people, the crowd. There was a crowd that had assembled. Remember, these were lewd, cello, cello, uh, uh, lewd fellows of the baser sort, so they knew how to r bring about a crowd if they wanted to. These would be the street urchins, you might say, of today. Well, the crowd assembled, and then it says here that when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, that word other, the rest of them, they let them go. In other words, they, maybe they took some kind of finance from them that um, was a, a, 
a surety that they would appear or that they would not cause any other trouble. The important thing about all of this is that whenever someone does not like something different about a certain people, the first thing that they go after is they're turning the world upside down. They worship another god different from ours. They want to usurp the order of uh, laws, etc., in uh, in the uh, country that they're in. Sounds a little bit like Nazi Germany of 1933 to the end of the World War II. They were people who were just different from the rest of us. The Jewish question, as the Nazis looked at it, and we need to get rid of those who make up this Jewish question. Nothing has changed from the first century AD. It doesn't matter if it's Paul preaching salvation by faith by grace in the person of Jesus, Messiah. It is that Satan does not want people to hear the word and he will stir up a crowd, create false messages. They are turning the world upside down, do anything that he possibly can to make things to be that aren't what they are. That's why you need to be in this book because the only way that you are going to be able to stand against this wrong teaching is to be in this book. May I encourage you in the days ahead to be teachers not just of others but to be teachers even of yourself. Find someone Find someone who you can sit with, whom you can be accountable with, accountable to, so that you can be a person of the book and make 2021 to be that kind of year for you. But that's why we exist as a ministry, Israel's Hope Ministry. We exist to teach these things, to encourage and challenge people to grow in the Lord. And we hope in some way we've been able to do that with you here today, either live or as you may look at these videos later on. We are a faith ministry. We trust God's people to be moved of the Lord himself so that we may be able to meet the needs that we have. And there are needs that are upcoming in the month of February that we have to be able to meet as time goes on. So we would urge you or ask you at least in the Lord if you may consider a gift to the work of the Ministry of Israel's Hope at this time. Thank you again for looking in. We would love to hear from you. If you'd like that brochure on Messianic Judaism, you may email me at ron at ihopecanada.org. You may go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org, and there you can find various other things that uh, might be an encouragement to you. Our page is under review right now and is being updated as we uh, uh, speak uh, with, uh, with people here. And so we are looking uh, to be with you again at another time. Let's close our time in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for everyone who's been looking in today. And we praise you for the freedom we've had. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time, we say, Shalom.